Hello there, welcome to my channel. My name is Doug and I'm back with another fountain pen review. Today I have a special two pen review in commemoration of the 78th anniversary on Monday, June 6th, of D-Day, the invasion of Normandy that was effectively the beginning of the end of the Second World War. And just how do fountain pens figure in the end of World War II, the big one? The end of the war in Europe happened in Reims, France, on May 7th, 1945, and the German Instrument of Surrender was signed using General Dwight D. Eisenhower's 1941 Parker 51. On September 2nd, 1945, the Japanese Instrument of Surrender was signed by General Douglas MacArthur on the deck of the USS Missouri using his bright red 1921 Parker Duofold. The two pens, like the two generals, couldn't be more different and both were innovations in their day and have become icons of what constitutes a fountain pen. The pens, not the generals. And the two pens I have restored and will be reviewing were graciously loaned to me by my neighbor and new pen friend, Teresa. Thank you, Teresa, for your generous loan of these beautiful writing instruments. This is Teresa's 1988 Parker Duofold Centennial, designed and released on Parker's 100th anniversary. The pen was a redesign and modernization of the classic Parker Duofold of the 1920s. And the model has become a classic in its own right, as we shall see when we look at its many imitators. The second is a 1954 Parker 51 that belonged to her late father, who purchased it new and had his name engraved on it. Both pens were in excellent shape and only needed some cleaning and polishing to bring them back to their almost new condition. Let's look at these two beautiful classic fountain pens right now. So the impetus for doing a video on these two pens together comes from two sources. The first was having my neighbor Teresa show me her two pens that have a lot of meaning to her personally and then loaning them to me for a review. But the second was, just prior to seeing these two pens from Teresa, I read an article from the National World War II Museum in New Orleans called Mightier Than the Sword, The Parker Pens That Ended World War II. I'll link the article in the description below. It's an interesting examination of the two Parker pens that ended World War II and how the two pens reflected the personalities of the two generals, MacArthur and Eisenhower. I find the dichotomies of these two pens and the two major figures in history to be endlessly fascinating. And the interesting contrast in these two pens continue the fascination for me. The older pen, belonging to Teresa's dad, represents the beginning of the modern age of fountain pens being designed right at the start of World War II in 1939. And the newer pen of the two, this 1988 Parker Duofold Centennial, represents the dawn of fountain pen design in the 1920s, although Parker has given it a modern treatment as a cartridge converter pen to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Parker's inception in 1888. So, new is old and old is new again. Let's look at Teresa's 1988 Parker Centennial first. In all of these discussions of fountain pen designs and fountain pen innovations, it's important to remember what was happening in the world and the world of fountain pens at the time of their design and release. 1988 might have been a time of celebration for Parker with their 100th anniversary, but things were not going well for fountain pens as far as sales were concerned. Certainly in the 1950s, everyone who was anyone was sporting a Parker 51 with its telltale arrow clip prominent in their shirt pockets or at least the cap anyway. Those who couldn't afford a whole Parker 51 would just get the cap to make it look like they had the status symbol on their person. But by 1988, that pocket was more likely to be occupied by a Bic crystal ballpoint pen than a fountain pen. And financial times were rough for Parker. That's when Parker in New Haven, England, which is just west of Brighton, launched the 100th anniversary redesigned Parker Duofold, the Centennial. The Parker Duofold Centennial was an incredible success and continues today, 34 years later, with many spin-offs and finish options, pens and pencil designs over the three decades. You can get a Parker Duofold 100th Anniversary Centennial brand new today for a little over a thousand bucks. 
This is one of the original Centennials. It was made in 1988 when Parker offered the new pen in their collector's editions. Teresa's husband bought this collector edition set when she started teaching in 1988. It comes with a desk stand that looks like mahogany to me, and it has a groove for the pen, a padded insert for a bottle of Parker Quink with an appropriately vintage 1920s label, and a brass plaque with the owner's name engraved. I took some photos of both pens before I did any work on them. The Centennial was in good but unused shape, and I only rinsed the section and nib out and put it in an ultrasonic bath of pen flush briefly to loosen dried ink. The 1988 Centennials came in three color options, black, blue marble, and maroon marble. Each had trim heavily plated with 23 karat gold. The barrels are a turned acrylic called methyl methyl acrylate. Say that 10 times fast. Let's look at the features. They kept the overall aesthetic of the original duofold, but made many significant modern adaptations. The black piston knob from the original has morphed into a tapered black plastic end finial. The clip is the more modern design Parker Arrow rather than the ball clip. The body and the cap are plastic and turned acrylic rather than the ebonite of the original. And more significant changes are on the inside. From the top, we see a 23 karat gold plated medallion with Centennial, the Parker Arrow logo, and 1888 to 1988 in raised letters. This medallion only exists on the 1988 models. It is embedded in a black plastic finial that is straight to a 23 karat gold clip ring and gold plated Parker Arrow clip. The clip is perfect nicely springy and usable. The cap is straight to two gold bands, one thin and one thick, and then the acrylic curves down to the barrel, which is straight until we get to two more gold plated rings, which separate the black plastic end finial from the barrel. The cap unscrews with one and about three quarters of a turn to reveal a black plastic tapering section with a rounded flare and two gold rings towards the 18 karat gold Parker Arrow nib. In 1988, you could order either 18 karat gold or 14 karat gold nibs in four standard and 22 non-standard grades. This is one of the non-standard grades as it's beautifully ground into a medium italic. And let's get a closer look at this now classic Parker Arrow nib. It has the Parker Arrow down the center in ruthenium and then Parker 18k and 750 for the gold content and the computer designed black plastic feed has no visible fins on the outside as they are on the upper side on the inside maybe you can see just a hint of those little fins underneath that nib i've learned that parker tumble polished these nibs in big drums full of walnut shells for like 24 hours to polish them Parker claimed the newly designed feed system would allow for the Centennial to be used at quote normal aircraft flight levels without burping. In the 2000s, Parker changed the nib codes on the back of the feeds to a lettering system. But from 1988, this nib has the code 94, uh, which means it's a medium italic. The section is another one of those major changes from the 1920s. The vintage section is short, with a two level step. I like the modern redesign very much. It's very comfortable, a good girth, and almost a perfect section for me. The nib and feet are not part of a nib assembly that unscrews, but are friction fit. Although I've not tried to remove them. The section unscrews to reveal the other internal modernization of the Dewar fold. The Centennial is a cartridge or a cartridge converter pen and takes either one long or two short Parker cartridges. And the inside of the cap shows a ledge milled into the acrylic, which meets up with the section to seal that nib from drying out. The cap posts, but not very deeply, uh, certainly securely, but not very deeply. This pen is not really designed to be written with. It's very, very long in the hand, but unposted, it is perfectly balanced and feels beautiful in the hand. This is a fountain pen right here, folks. Beautiful classic. Now let's look at the Parker 51. Parker had a hit with the dual fold in the 1920s and it was the fountain pen to own. Everything was black until Parker discovered a way to make ebonite in a color, red. 
and that big red duofold was used by MacArthur to end hostilities in the Pacific in 1944. But Eisenhower's 1941 Parker 51 was the modern fountain pen of that time. It was designed in 1939 and released just months before Pearl Harbor and therefore didn't really hit the market until the war was over. Eisenhower had one of the new ones in this gorgeous pen and pencil set that was used to sign the end of hostilities in Europe. After the war, Eisenhower presented the set to President Truman and it now resides in the Truman Presidential Library. What was so modern and innovative in 1945? Well, Parker created the hooded nib, which helped keep the ink from drying out while the pen is uncapped. The internal feed system was also a major innovation, as was the vacuumatic filling system with which the first 51s were equipped. The pen is sleek and light and posts deeply to become a truly modern, for 1945, fountain pen. No one had seen anything like this before. And this is a 1954-55 Parker 51 with a gold-filled six-line cap that's almost identical to the cap on my friend Ron's dad's 1954 Parker 51 bought in Canada. The only difference is this one's in burgundy and this one's in black. And the one in black has made in the USA on the back of the cap, which started in 1954 and dates them both to 1954-56 along with the used Super Chrome on the aromatic fillers, which was replaced with used Parker ink in 1956. The Burgundy 51 was probably made in Canada, hence no made in the USA indication on the cap. Well, why don't we just say made in Canada, buddy? Well, no one knows where Canada is, friend. He's not your friend, guy. I'm not your guy, buddy. Here's a photo of Teresa's Parker 51 before I worked on it. It had some dried ink in it and the cap was tarnished and the clip was loose. The pen was obviously sitting in a desk for a long period of time. But this just shows how well things were built in the 1950s. I rinsed everything in pen flush and put them in an ultrasonic cleaner for a bit to loosen up the grit. It took a lot of squeezing to get all of the old ink out. I put the barrel on this dowel um, on which I've taped a uh, pencil eraser and then I used a very fine polishing compound to get out the scratches and to polish up the plastic. It is silicone and alcohol free and I've used it for years on the very fragile nitrocellulose finishes of my $6,000 and $8,000 acoustic guitars with great results. There's also a product called Simichrome which many people have recommended but I have not tried. There are also other ways of getting this plastic into factory new shiny shape but that involves doing some abrasive sanding and polishing in sequential steps with micro mesh but for a pen with this much character and history a good polish is all that's needed much of that wear is patina made by the owner and you don't want to polish that away the cap also polished up beautifully and i used this jeweler's polishing cloth to do that and that's the nice thing about some thick gold plating it can last for decades and be polished many times without wearing through to the metal. I tightened the cap and the jewel finial by pressing it down and turning it on a piece of rubber. There's some substantial wear where the clip touches the cap, but you can't see that under the clip. The plastic section had significant scratching and wear, but I polished it up with the polishing compound and it came up very nicely. And the Parker 51 is the best posting fountain pen ever. Very few other pens post so perfectly and make the pen so really nicely balanced in the hand. This is the way all pens should post. When I removed the cap on this Parker 51, I was expecting to find what you always find, a 14 karat gold medium hooded Parker nib. But I was surprised when I saw this Architect grind. I had no idea Architect nibs were around in 1954. Or perhaps this was a Parker Broad that was custom ground, but I expect it's stock. I did find out that Parker did make an architect-like nib for the Parker 51 called an Arabic nib that looked very similar to this. It was also called a Hebrew nib back in the day. Today we call them architects. So with a 1988 Parker Duofold Centennial with an italic nib and a 1954 Parker 51 with an Arabic nib, I'm excited to do some writing with these resurrected beauties. I'm going to forgo the size comparisons because these two pens are so incredibly well known for their sizes and shapes. I'll show some measurements for each pen and then I'll get to the writing samples.
And we're back with the writing portion of the review. This is Claire Fontaine 90 GSM paper, and this is the Parker Dual Fold Centennial and it has an 18 karat gold medium italic nib let's check the wetness well this is very very dry very dry it's not flowing well at all and this might be due to the ink uh, because the ink is Parker Quink Blue Black which is a fairly dry ink that's where Quink comes from quick ink quick drying ink uh, but it's not just that I think this feed has some issues with it it took me a while to get this pen to write I cleaned it out thoroughly using pen flush and an ultrasonic cleaner but the nib wasn't flowing I flossed the nib and the tines were very tight but upon inspection with my loop I discovered there was some uh, pasty white particulate in underneath the feed between the feed and the nib I teased it out with a shim and injecting water with force from a syringe into those edges right there until it finally began to write it still feels ink starved so I might do some more soaking and cleaning as there is something in there that is blocking the flow of the ink the nib is very smooth which is very nice for what I consider a crisp italic generally you'll get a lot of feedback uh, with this kind of uh, nib I bought a bottle of this Parker Quink blue black uh, to fill the bottle that was empty from uh, Teresa's set uh, but I filled this with that ink to keep that vintage label intact very nice and here are some closed matches to this ink from inkswatch.com and that's the line variation well that's what this pen does and I tell it gives you that thin horizontal and thick vertical but the nib is very bouncy as well so that 18 karat gold so you can give it a little extra pressure if you like it's very nice and smooth and bouncy nib and there's that characteristic italic flavor that you get with no pressure and the line that this nib makes horizontally is 0, 0 0.3 millimeters and vertically it is 0 0.7 millimeters which makes it a western extra extra fine to medium broad or a Japanese extra fine to broad and for our quote And to some reverse writing well very scratchy <laughs> and as you can see not designed for reverse writing it is an italic after all and some quick writing you can see that it has plenty of issues keeping up because that flow is impeded so I'm going to do some more work on this nib to make sure that that feed is unclogged and this is the Parker 51 and it is 1954 
and it has a 14 karat gold Arabic nib. What we know is an architect today. And again, the ink is Parker Quink Blue Black. Parker developed a new ink with the Parker 51 in 1939 and it was uh, called a Super Chrome. I don't believe there is Super Chrome anymore because apparently it was fairly dangerous ink uh, to your pen. But uh, this quink or quick drying ink from Parker is really a, a match for this pen. And that's the idea to keep the line drying very quickly as you write and the hooded nib design keeps the ink from drying out while you're writing. And this pen is incredibly smooth. For an architect style, which generally gets a lot of feedback, this is ultra smooth. I was astonished by how smooth this pen wrote the first time. I expected a lot of feedback from this architect style nib and it's just the opposite. I wrote for a couple of hours in my journal with this pen and all I can say is this is a quick, quick, fast, smooth, light, easy to on the hand. You can write for hours with this pen. This is an amazing fountain pen. It's light and well balanced and feels like a Ferrari on the page. I fell in love with this pen instantly and I quickly compared it to some of my other hooded pens that I love. This is my Wing Sung 601 Flighter. And it has a Bobby Bent nib or Bobby Mini Fude, which has that characteristic thin vertical and thick horizontal to it as well. I love this pen. And then there's another pen that I really love, and that's the Schaefer Icon. And the and this one also has a Bobby Mini Fude architect style nib with the thin vertical and the thick horizontal. You can call that semi-hooded, I would think. And just in case you want to know, this is Leonardo Blue. And this is Dimine Oxblood. But neither of these pens can hold a candle to the ultra smooth, fast writing Parker 51. Arabic. Beautiful pen. I'm hoping that Teresa will love writing with her dad's Parker 51 as this pen deserves to be used every day. It's simply the best hooded nib fountain pen experience I've ever had. This pen makes a 0 0.4 millimeter vertical line and a 0 0.6 millimeter horizontal line which makes it a Western XF to M or a Japanese F to medium broad. And for our quote, And for some reverse writing, it's very scratchy, as to be expected, but it actually does it. And some quick writing.
this is what this pen does the best it I can't read it of course but it just keeps up and keeps writing and is smooth 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 beautiful pen so what do I like and what do I not like about these fountain pens well they are true classics aren't they the duofold dates from the 1920s and is still a highly collectible pen the redesigned 1988 Parker duofold centennial basically took the classic duofold and updated it for the modern era and it was and is so successful that the redesign has spawned many imitators from the Moonman M600 to the Jinhao 100 Centennial and the Kaigaloo 316 and the modern by 1945 standards Parker 51 has become another much imitated innovator in the pen industry for Parker the hooded design seems to be all over the place from this Wingsong 601 to the Wingsong 618 and the Jinhao 85 which is more like the modern Parker 51 and of course the Hero 100. It's too bad Parker hasn't been able to continue its brand dominance for the last century into the 21st. Most of their pens are now made in their three factories in China but their high-end fountain pens are made in Britain and France. Parker is owned by Newell Brands and is now in the family with Waterman Rotring, Papermate, and that other presidential pen maker of renown, Sharpie. There's a new Parker Duofold out called the Queen's Platinum Jubilee 2022 Limited Edition, and it can be yours for only $2,638 US. Go wild, buy two. But this new Jinhao 100 Centennial in Galaxy with ivory section and finials is also really nice for only 25 bucks and I'll be reviewing this new Jinhao tomorrow morning so don't forget to watch for that and there you have it thanks go out to Teresa for the loan of these two beautiful writing instruments that hold so much personal sentiment as well as some fascinating world history if you like this video please like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that bell to get instant notifications whenever a new video is posted and please look in the description for a link to gold spot pens as i'm now an affiliate of the online store and when you shop at gold spot you'll be supporting my channel as well at no extra cost to you you can also join as a member of my channel for only 99 cents a month and i guarantee i'll answer your comments in the comment section and you'll get cool emojis badges and sneak peek unboxing videos as well and that just leaves it for me to say thank you for watching and that's all she wrote <laughs>